Good afternoon. How are you doing today? My name is Juan Carlos Brando, and uh, for me, it's a pleasure to have every one of you joining us in this show with one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Woman Associates. Of course, this is a, it's my pleasure to uh, get to talk to you, to receive one of the attorneys, and also to be able to uh, give you answers for your immigration questions. So uh, today we're gonna have one of the attorneys is the attorney Noor Chamas, who is uh, one of the uh, experts that we have in the law firm that helps with, um, along with the other 14, 15 attorneys working together with the attorney Margaret W. Wong. So uh, let's welcome the attorney Noor. How are you doing today? I am doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, attorney. And well, um, we have a question. It's very interesting that before, even before we started the show, we got this question. I don't know how this happened, but it happened. Um, and this person says, is Sandra Virgin or Virgin, uh, what is moral turpitude? Okay, so um, moral turpitude. So there are specific types of crimes that are called crimes involving moral turpitude. And what these are, are crimes that are considered especially immoral, how I would describe it. Um, they are crimes that are considered especially base or vile, that they shock the public conscience. Uh, usually it involves crimes such as, I mean, for example, it'd be like something like rape is considered moral turpitude, moral turpitude obviously. Murder is obviously a moral turpitude crime, but that's another story. Um, but there are other crimes that you may not think would be morally turpitudinous, but they are considered so. Um, like one of them is fraud. Anything that involves fraud, if you forge a document or if you have a fake document, that could be considered a crime involving moral turpitude. Um, uh, obviously, if it's uh, you know arson, if you start a fire, that's, con that's considered a crime involving moral turpitude. But there are also other crimes that are too many to list right now. Um, but for usually you would need an attorney to sort of do research and figure out if a specific crime is, is, is one involving moral turpitude. Um, so if you have a question about a specific crime or conviction, you probably should consult an attorney and find out. Because if you are convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude, that could impact your eligibility for specific immigration benefits. Well... Uh, what about these people that um, that they give fake information about their taxes or when they do the, their income tax return? Mm -hmm. uh, is that a moral turpitude uh, crime? I mean, I guess it would depend. If it's a straight out fraud, then yes, it could be moral turpitude. And, and, and they would have to be convicted of a crime. So it's not like... Just because somebody did something on their taxes and maybe got a little bit more money, but they were never convicted of anything, there would be no crime there or no crime of moral turpitude there. So they wouldn't have to worry about that. It would, that could go into their good moral character uh, involved with certain applications, but it would not be a crime involving moral turpitude. It would actually have to be a conviction for something involving some sort of fraud. Okay. And uh, what about shoplifting, which is very common? Uh, and I would ask um, shoplifting, DUI, mm -hmm. are those considered um, moral turpitude crimes? So shoplifting could be considered a crime of moral turpitude because theft crimes in general are considered crimes involving moral turpitude. DUIs are not actually considered crimes involving moral turpitude. They have repeatedly uh, courts have repeatedly stated that DUIs are not uh, crimes involving moral turpitude. However, with shoplifting, there's also an exception. So uh, under the Immigration and Nationality Act, the section that involves crimes involving moral turpitude, there's an exception to crimes if the maximum possible sentence of a crime is no more than one year. And if the person that was convicted was, con was sentenced to no more than six months, 
in uh, jail, then th there's something called the petty offense exception. So even if the crime in general would be considered a crime involving moral turpitude, if those requirements, I mean, if those conditions were met, then there would be an exception called the petty offense exception. And so they would not be considered to have uh, been convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude. Well, that's only if they only were convicted of one crime. If it was more than one, then they can't use the petty offense exception. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And don't forget that you can call. The phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 is the phone number that you need to call. We have another question coming in, and it says, um, I received a letter, a letter saying that I have an amount of money in the Bank of America, uh, but I need to be a citizen. Uh, please, if you have an answer for me, I don't know if this is about uh, immigration because it says that it's for refugees and I am a refugee from Afghanistan. So uh, I don't know what I need to do. I have no idea what this letter is. Um, you do not need to be a U.S. citizen to have a bank account. I mean, I know that, and I, I'm not sure what this letter, sometimes there are letters sent out that are scams, so I'm not sure if this is one of them. Um, if you do have money in a bank and it's your money, then you should be able to access it. I don't see why you wouldn't be able to, and you would not need to be a U.S. citizen. So always be wary of these letters if they tell you that you have money, but you need certain conditions. Um, I don't know what those letters are. I'm, I'm not sure what specific letter this is. Unless I see it, it'd be hard for me to comment on it other than to say that you don't need to be a U.S. citizen to have access to a bank account. Okay, thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And uh, we'll, we have a question here. It says, uh, my 17-year-old son was beaten in school. Uh, they called the police and he went to the hospital. We don't have documents. Um, is this something that could apply for them for maybe uh, any kind of relief? It's possible that you would qualify for a, a U visa for victims of crime if your child is a minor. I'm assuming that child is a U.S. citizen. So if the child is a U.S. citizen and he's a victim of a crime, you can be considered an indirect victim of the crime. Uh, and so you would be able to qualify for a U visa. However, if the child is not a U.S. citizen, um, you could be a derivative of the child. That child could file for a U visa, and you could be a derivative of the child's U visa petition. So it depends on the facts of the case, but it's possible that it, that it could help you, yes. Yes, it says that he was born in Mexico, so uh, probably... So the child was born in Mexico? Yes, the child was born in Mexico and mom doesn't have any documents. Yeah, she. I mean, if the child was born in Mexico, he could petition and then she could be a derivative of the child's petition. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. Uh, don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Uh, one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong. Uh, you can talk to them, you can ask your question right now and ask for more information if you have a chance to call to the office. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. The attorney Margaret W. Wong is today in the city of Atlanta. Uh, tomorrow she will be in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, yesterday she was uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we have today attorney Noor. Thank you so much for taking some time for this show because we know that you are always busy, uh, either in court or filing documents. So we know that it's a lot of work. Um, the next question we have uh, right now is, um, well, this person was born in Mexico. Well, this next question is, uh, I came from Ukraine and I want to know if I need to file asylum or I receive an immigrant condition at the moment that I enter to the United States. Um, so there is like special conditions for um, Ukrainian citizens uh, currently. 
Um, however, I mean, it depends. So if you do have a fear of returning to Ukraine um, and you want to get uh, asylum benefits, then I suggest that you do file an application for asylum because the benefits currently that Ukrainian citizens have are temporary in nature. So it wouldn't allow you to become a permanent resident, for example, unless you qualify um, under another type of application, one of which could be asylum. So if you file for asylum and you're granted asylum, then eventually you can become a lawful permanent resident and ultimately a U.S. citizen. So my suggestion is that if you do have a fear of returning to Ukraine and that you do feel that you would be harmed or persecuted if you were to return, then I would strongly urge that you do file an application for asylum. And if you're not sure, then I would strongly urge you to consult an attorney to see if you have an actual viable asylum claim. Thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And, well, don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. Next question. How long can I stay overseas if I am LPR? Okay, so that question is actually more complicated than it seems. Uh, so there's two, uh, there's two aspects of that. One is, you know, how long... Are you able to stay overseas in order to maintain your lawful permanent resident status? And the other question would be, how long should you stay overseas in order to qualify for naturalization when you want to file for naturalization? So the first, um, generally speaking, you shouldn't stay overseas for more than a year in order to maintain your lawful permanent resident status. However, um, that's not the end of it. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. You have to establish always that you are primarily a resident of the United States if you are a lawful permanent resident or you have status as a lawful permanent resident in order to keep that status. Because if it looks like you are not a resident of the U.S., you may have that status revoked. So, for example, if you travel abroad, say, for six months and then you return to the U.S. and you stay here for two or three weeks, then you travel abroad for another eight months, then you come back to the U.S. and you stay here for a week, then you travel again for several months, then by that time you return, you might be questioned at the port of entry about why you've been staying so long outside the U.S. And that may ultimately, you, you may ultimately run the risk of having your LPR status revoked. That's in terms of maintaining your LPR status. Now, for naturalization purposes, you have to demonstrate uh, when you file for naturalization, that you've had five years of continuous residence in the U.S. What that means, five years of continuous residence, residence means that at no point did you travel abroad for a period of six months or greater. Um, and also, in addition to that, you have to have you have to show that you've had at least half of the five years. That means two and a half years of actual physical presence in the U.S. So that means if you add up all your travels abroad and all your stays in the U.S., two and a half years of that time, you have to show that you were physically present in the U.S. Um, so, you know, those are the two aspects. But I, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. I, I think you did. So uh, if you have any other question, please call the office. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216 Two seven nine three nine eight four. Um, next question is: I am from Somalia. My asylum was denied. I have four kids. They are U.S. citizens, but their dad died in a car accident two years ago. Can I fight to stay here in the United States? Okay, so. Um... Question would be number one is when you say your asylum was denied, do you mean that it was denied by an immigration judge and you were ordered removed by an immigration court? Or do you mean that your asylum was not approved by the immigration service? Because there would be a difference. If your asylum was denied at the immigration court level, and that means you were ordered removed, then at this point there's you know, very little that you can do. You could potentially file an application for a stay of removal based on hardship to your U.S. citizen children, which would allow you to stay longer in the U.S., but ultimately it does not cure your order of removal or allow you to have any status. 
Now, if you mean that your asylum status was, I mean, I apologize, your asylum application was not approved by an immigration officer, that would mean that your asylum now will be referred to the immigration court and you will have another opportunity to uh, file, uh, I mean, present your asylum claim before an immigration judge. Now, you said it says you said you have four U.S. citizen children. I wasn't sure if uh, you indicated how long you've been living in the U.S., but if you've been living in the U.S. for greater than 10 years, then you would be eligible for something called cancellation of removal, which is based on you showing that you've been in the U.S. for at least 10 years, that you've been a person of good moral character during that time, that you have qualifying relatives, meaning spouse, uh, parent or child who is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, in this case, your four children. And finally, that your qualifying relative, in this case, your children, would suffer exceptional and extremely unusual hardship if you had to return to your country. So um, it's a possibility you'd be able to show that in this case. Uh, again, I would strongly advise that you consult with an attorney um, when you have these types of cases, because it's a little bit complicated and an attorney would be better able to determine it. So depending on where your case is or how your asylum uh, application was denied, um, the answer might be different. Okay, thank you very much, attorney. And yeah, well, they were uh, completing the, the question. They said that the case was denied in court and this person is in removal proceedings. So, um, I mean, the other option, I don't, I don't know if the case is on appeal currently, um, there is one way, and I mean, that depends on the case. I'm not sure what happened with your case. Um, so, for example, if the notice to appear, which is the notice that puts you in immigration court proceedings, if it lacks a date and time of your next hearing date, um, so in those circumstances, you might be able to reopen the case on that basis because... Um, based on a Supreme Court decision, uh, if a notice to appear does not have a date and time, then that notice never stops your continuous physical presence in the US for the purposes of cancellation of removal. So there could be a possibility for you to reopen the case in order to file for cancellation of removal, depending on what happened before. But obviously, I can't, I can't answer that question um, directly because I don't know exactly the facts of your case. So again, I would strongly advise that you consult with an attorney and, and if you come to our office, we'd be happy to uh, consult with you and go over your facts and see if there's anything available for you. Yeah, I would say that maybe the question, the actual question is, if this person is in uh, removal proceedings and this person is already uh, about to go to court, if, if she has like enough uh, hardship to to prove that she needs to stay in the United States, and it would be the hardship for the kids, I guess, because right. if your dad died and they are now struggling here, so uh, would it be a good reason to fight for hardship? I mean, it looks uh, so. Again, obviously, we would have to look at the exact facts, but yes, I mean that's a possibility if if the father unfortunately passed away in a car accident you know the kids only have the mother now and if she had to go back you know the kids would have to go back with her they wouldn't be able to stay with anybody here and then also depending on how old they are you know whether they speak the language what the conditions of Somalia are which I know you know are not great at this point um, there could be there could be sufficient hardship there that would qualify you for cancellation of removal so it's a possibility that you would qualify. Again, I, I always will advise you that you should consult with an attorney and we would be happy to help you with that. Thank you very much, attorney. And the next question we have is, hello, please, what are the steps an asylee der derivative needs to take immediately after enter entering to the United States? Okay, so if you are an immediate relative of a person who has asylum granted and you were not granted asylum as a derivative on the application you just entered um, there you would have to file something called an i-730 as a follow to join it allows immediate relatives uh, based on the asylum grant of their immediate relative they would be able to uh, 
uh, gain asylum status here in the U.S. Um, now, that there's conditions to that. Number one is the I-730 is supposed to be filed within two years of the grant of asylum to the principal applicant. Um, now, if it's outside the two years, it's still possible that you could get it granted if you have um, good reason, good cause as to why the uh, application wasn't filed within two years. You also, um, if you are a uh, spouse, you have to have been married at the time that the asylum was granted. Um, and also, if you're a child, you have to be under 21 years of age. If you're over 21, then you wouldn't be able to file an I-730. But if you do fall within one of those conditions, then when you enter the country, you can file an I-730. Once it's granted, you get you you get asylum status, and ultimately, uh, you can file to become a lawful permanent resident and a U.S. citizen. Thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And well, Pela, don't forget that you can call the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. That's the phone number that you need to call in order to get in touch with the attorneys. Um, we're receiving another question. It says, my son is a U.S. citizen, but he is very vile. He beat me up three times, and he says that he wants to kill me. I am his dad. Is it true that I can apply for a VAWA? Uh, yes, actually, that is true. If um, a U.S. citizen child um, is... Uh, extremely cruel or violent toward a parent, that parent could potentially qualify uh, for a VAWA. So if you do have those facts, I would urge you to consult with an attorney. And um, again, in this office, we would be happy to help you with that. Okay, thank you very, very much uh, for this answer. Don't forget, you can uh, call the office to the phone number 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. Also, um, you can visit one of the offices in the seven cities that uh, we have offices, uh, which are Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, um, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is just one, 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Is the phone number that you need to call in order to uh, talk to the attorneys. The next question comes on our WhatsApp uh, number, and it says, um, my mom has been here in the United States for uh, seven years already. Um, she tried to stay uh, away from the government away from any uh, kind of proof that the government could notice that she was here. Uh, she is Venezuelan and Colombian. My question is, we filed for her TPS, but we received an RFE, which says that we need to prove that she has been here before 2021. So she entered legally on... Um, B1, B2 visa with her passport, Venezuelan passport. The question is, um, what do we need to prove with this RFE? Uh, because we sent church letters, we sent other information that we have. We have pictures that when my daughters were born here in the United States, she was here and she has the entry, uh, the, the seal, or the stamp in her passport that she was here before March 2021. So um, what else do we need to use to prove that she was here so that her GPS can be approved? Okay. So just, just in general, I would advise, you know, when people ask the questions that whenever you're referencing a letter or an RFE or anything that you're, any sort of correspondence that you're getting, if I don't read it, I wouldn't know exactly what it's asking for, so it would be hard for me to give you a, an extremely accurate answer, but I can speak in generality. So um, if the RFE, and also if I don't know exactly what you filed, then I don't know what else you would need, but I can tell you, generally speaking, when you're trying to prove um, presence in the US, 
for anything, not just for TPS. Um, there are several things that you can use to show that. You can use um, bills that you paid that are in your name. You can use receipts of places that you've been to. Um, you can use even medical records if you had visited doctors. You can use tax returns if you file taxes. If you were employed, you can use W-2s or even pay stubs to show that you are here. Um, and yeah, you, you can use letters. Generally, letters are not um, treated as um, you know very dispositive disp forms of evidence uh, because anybody can write a letter. Um, it is preferable that you actually provide documents that are more official in nature, such as bills and receipts and uh, school records and medical records and things like that that clearly establish that you were here. Letters can be used to fill gaps. So sometimes if you provide a lot of documents and then there are certain gaps where it's not clear if you were here or not, you can you can provide a letter from somebody that can confirm that you were present at the time. Um, so that's I'm sorry that that's a general answer for you because I, I don't know what exactly is in the RFE, but those would be suggestions of um, what you would file. Now, RFEs can be complicated. So again, if you get an RFE normally, I would advise that you go consult with an attorney because um, you don't want to risk having the application denied because you didn't properly respond to the RFE or you didn't provide the documents that were necessary to have your case approved. Thank you so much, Attorney Noor. And yeah, um, well, I have the the RFV letter here, but it's it's going to be hard to read it. <laughs> so if if you want to call the office, make an appointment with one of the attorneys in the office, and they will give you the advice. Just make sure that you take all of the documents and you show them what you have, and they will tell you what to do and how to put it in order so that you can send it back to immigration. Um, the next, uh, and it will be the last question because our time is up. It says, what goes faster for work permit, the physical application or the online filing? Well, at this point, the processing time is gonna be the processing time, whatever the processing time is uh, for USCIS. Uh, what's faster is that when you file it online, um, you know, it immediately gets filed and you immediately get a receipt notice. So you don't have to wait for one for several weeks sometimes. Um, but in terms of how fast the uh, application is actually processed, I don't, I don't think it makes a difference because it's, it's whatever the current processing times are, they are what they are, whether you file online or you file uh, in paper form. But definitely it would be more quickly filed if you do it online and you would immediately receive a receipt notice. Okay, that's perfect. So thank you so much, Attorney Noor. Uh, we know that our time is up for now, uh, but thank you so much for all of the answers, for sharing your knowledge, and for uh, well giving us some advice uh, about what we can do in our immigration situation. So have a good lunch. Thank, thank you. you so much. And looking forward to see you soon. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. The offices of Margaret W. Woman Associates in seven cities of the United States, Atlanta, Columbus, Chicago, Cleveland, Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And there is only one phone number, 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. See you next time.